Okay, so this is our last lecture. I want to do a few things. Uh, I have a case history, the San Jacinto Monument. Then I will talk about uh, different types of foundation solutions for light buildings on shrink swell soils. And then uh, I want to finish by going over the, you know, all the things that we've covered in the uh, in the course. So let me turn off the lights, and then we'll talk about the uh, San Jacinto Monument. So the San Jacinto Monument uh, is, uh, was built in 1936 to commemorate the 100 year anniversary of the uh, independence uh, of Texas, the Battle of San Jacinto, uh, won by uh, the Texan army over the Mexican army and Sam Houston was uh, in charge, uh, General Houston was in charge of that, uh, of that uh, army and uh, won the battle. These are the credits of uh, the information that we gathered. Uh, so March 2nd, 1836, Texas declares its independence from Mexico. Uh, the Mexicans don't like that and on March 6th is the Battle of the Alamo and uh, General Santa Ana defeats uh, Texas uh, quite soundly at, uh, on that occasion. Uh, the uh, uh, Texans retrieve and uh, uh, Sam Houston is put in charge of uh, developing an army to resist uh, the progression of the Mexican army and on April 21, 1836, uh, the Battle of San Jacinto takes place in uh, Texas uh, with Sam Houston defeats Mexico and that's where the name of the city of Houston comes from. So this structure was erected a hundred years later in 1936 to commemorate that uh, very important victory uh, and you can see that it looks uh, quite close to the uh, Washington Monument that we talked about in an earlier lecture. It's, uh, uh, in fact, it has uh, uh, a foundation. So Raymond Dawson was the engineer that was in charge of the foundation and did a really good job. Uh, it's about 38 meters wide. It's a square foundation and uh, the monument is about 160 meters uh, high. <clears throat> and the story goes that the, uh, Texas, uh, the Texans asked for help from the federal government, uh, and the federal government said, well, no problem, we'll uh, help you to build that, uh, that uh, column, uh, but make sure it's not any higher than the uh, Washington monument. And Texas said, sure, we'll do that, but they forgot to say that they were going to put a big star, a lone star, at the, at the top of the column. And so actually when you look in the uh, Guinness uh, Book of World Record, uh, the San Jacinto Monument is actually taller than the, uh, than the uh, Washington Monument. Anyway, the uh, foundation, uh, so this is 1936 and reinforced concrete uh, comes about in about 1910 or so. So by 1936, we know about reinforced concrete, whereas for the Washington Monument, we didn't know yet uh, how to, to build those types of foundation. Because Washington Monument is 18, where it's completed in uh, 1884, whereas this is 1936, or about 50 years later. But you can see the amount of steel in the foundation is quite significant. Uh, and here is the construction process taking place. And then uh, here are some of the pressures and the loading. The gross pressure, the pr if you put your hand under the foundation, you will feel 224 kilopascal. So remember, the Tower of Pisa is around 500 kPa. Uh, the uh, Washington Monument is around 500 kPa, so here the San Jacinto Monument is quite a bit lighter than these, uh, and the foundation quite, quite a bit larger than these uh, other structures, and so we are, we're at 224. 
and, and uh, it's on stiff clay. Uh, the net pressure after the mats was poured was about 10 kp. And that was, the weight of the soil was about the same as the weight of the foundation. The, uh, uh, Raymond Dawson was uh, uh, placed a benchmark, had a benchmark placed so he could record the settlement of the structure as a function of time, which was a very good idea. And as a result of this, we have the settlement of this very large structure uh, for about uh, the last, uh, well, ever since it was built, 1936. So we've got tremendously long settlement record uh, according to, with respect to that benchmark. So here is the uh, stratigraphy at the side, basically stiff clay, you know, the uh, stiff clay that's quite well known in the Houston area. Some sand layers uh, that facilitate uh, drainage to some extent, but overall, stiff to very stiff clay is the soil at the site. And you can see some of the index properties. Here is the unit weight, the water content, the plasticity index quite high at the top. Uh, this is uh, something done in uh, borings done in 1953 and then we did some more recent bor borings with the help of Fugro in 2007. So the water content, PI, but approximately the same. Uh, values. We also did uh, some uh, consolidation tests, and uh, you know, since we discussed consolidation tests in a uh, previous lecture, you can see here void ratio versus sigma prime vertical effective stress on the log scale, and the typical shape of these. Uh, this is the dotted line is 1953 and the uh, black uh, solid line is 2007. And again here, plotted as normal, natural arithmetic scale of effective stress versus vertical strain, the typical stress strain curve, and the tendency for that curve to curve upward, because the more pressure you put on the, uh, on the soil, on that disk of soil within that steel ring, the more you feel the influence of the steel ring and some other two other tests uh, here and again the stress strain curve that curls upward uh, which is unusual uh, consolidation uh, the, here is the compression index as a function of depth here is the recompression index as a function of depth and here is the coefficient of consolidation in meter square per second as a function of depth so all this is measured in the consolidation test here is the, uh, the stress uh, at the site, vertical effective stress, and the pre-consolidation pressure. And I mentioned several times that the pre-consolidation pressure could be due to overburden, like the ice in Chicago, but it can also be due to uh, desiccation. When the material gets desiccated, it increases the stress uh, through the suction that develops and that process can actually pre-consolidate or over-consolidate the material. And then here is sigma prime P. And just remember this because it's going to become uh, interesting in the future. This is sigma prime P in 1953. This is sigma prime P in 2007. So it's quite a bit of difference uh, between the two. And the, the, the answer to this question is that due, between those two uh, times, uh, there was quite a bit of pumping of the water in the Houston area, and the lowering of the water level uh, between those two dates uh, probably is the cause for the increase in pre-consolidation pressure. And then you see the, uh, some of the other results, uh, tip the cone penetrometer, uh, tip resistance. This is done again in uh, 2007. Did some pressure meter test as well. Uh, here is the pressure meter. It's ready to go into the uh, open hole. And here is a typical curve that we get from the pressure meter. Here is the, the linear part where we get the modulus from, and then the limit pressure that we get from the, uh, the final part here of the curve. Also, 
Here's the limit pressure profile of those tests. We went down to 35 meters, uh, the modulus, the reload modulus, and the trip exponent. Here is the undrained shear strength uh, from uh, various types of measurement. 1953 and then 2007 from pocket penetrometer, cone penetrometer, and pressure meter test. So order of magnitude 100 kPa uh, or so for the undrained shear strength. And we have talked about the ultimate bearing capacity uh, when we did the, uh, uh, the, at the end of the lectures on shear strength, the application to the Tower of Pisa where we say the ultimate pressure you can get from the soil is about six times the undrained shear strength. And I just told you the undrained shear strength is around 100. So 100 times six, you're at 600. And uh, this, uh, since the pressure was around 200, uh, you have a reasonable factor of safety uh, by all types of evaluation. So the bearing capacity is not an issue for the uh, San Jacinto volume. Settlement calculations. We have, uh, uh, we did some uh, abacus finite element method studies and, and uh, simulations to obtain the uh, increase in vertical stress with depth due to the placement of the uh, uh, San Jacinto monument. And then we did the settlement calculations, uh, and you see by various methods, consolidation, cone penetrometer, pressure meter test, and the measured settlement is about 0.33 uh, meters uh, over that period of time, so about one foot over the period from 1936 to 2000, I believe, the, yeah, 2006 is the last measurement uh, that, that we took. So reasonably good uh, values of uh, predicted and, and measured. We don't always get that close. And then here is the actual settlement uh, that was measured. So starting in 1936, and then as a function of time, and now we're in about 2006, and you can see that it's around 0.3 meters of settlement. And the dual values is because it's measured at one edge of the, the mat, at the other edge of the mat, and then the, the mean value in the middle. One of the things that was a puzzle when we did this uh, work was that this was right during a time where, as I mentioned earlier, Houston was pumping water out of the, uh, that's how Houston was getting their, their tap water. They were pumping from aquifers under the city. And you can see the pumping was significant. Here is the water level in 1936. Here is the water level in 1975 or so. So that's 90 meters. That's a huge drawdown of the water level. And this is from a well at the location of the San Jacinto Monument. And then in 1973 or four, uh, the city of Houston started to realize that there were some serious issues associated with this uh, subsidence of the ground surface, uh, and, and they stopped getting their water from that aquifer below the city, and instead uh, uh, they're getting the water from lakes around the, the city. So as a result of stopping this subsidence, uh, the, the water level has been going back up and up and up, ever since that time, and now we're still not quite where it used to be, but it certainly has gone up uh, significantly. But here is a, a map of Houston. Uh, the, the ship channel is right here, uh, and uh, the uh, San Jacinto Monument is around here. You can see these are meters contours. So three meter contour here, 2.5 meter contour right there. That's how much the city of Houston has gone down over that period of time where they were drawing the water from the aquifer below the city. So very significant. Uh, Mexico City is another city where there's been significant. There are 10 meters of, of uh, subsidence in Mexico City. So 
this is a very, very uh, serious uh, issue. So that's the last case history. Let me turn on the lights and uh, we'll come back. So what I want to do now is talk a little bit about uh, foundations for uh, light buildings on shrink swell soils and then I'll finish uh, by uh, talking a little bit about what, uh, uh, what we've covered in the class uh, since the beginning of the semester. So uh, I'm going to show you four different solutions for the foundation. I'll write it here, foundation. foundations uh, for light buildings light buildings on shrink swell soils and you have different choices alright the first choice I might want to put to the, the first choice is called uh, stiffen slab on grade. Okay, so that's the first solution. And that solution consists of placing the slab on the ground. So you have a slab like this, and it has beams every so often and the ground surface is here uh, and the house or the light building goes on top of this foundation so this is ground surface so it's slab on grade uh, it's not reinforced this part is relatively thin uh, this can be only uh, 0.1 meter, let's say. Uh, these beams are uh, about 1 meter deep. They could be 1.2 meter as well. And the spacing between beams, uh, I would say uh, uh, 4 meters. Okay? In both directions. Sometimes they're called waffle slabs because they look like waffles. But the whole idea is that this slab has a large bending moment resistance or, or bending stiffness rather. In other words, if the soil tries to move, as we were talking about in the previous lecture, moves on the outside but not so much on the inside, that bends the house, the right building, and the foundation. So the whole idea, the best way to design these foundations on shrink swell soil is to make sure you have foundation that doesn't bend. And the, the idea here is to make sure that the beams are deep enough and closely spaced, spaced enough that the, the, uh, the foundation doesn't bend beyond a certain tolerance. And, and that's the basis for the design of these. Uh, so, this uh, uh, this type of foundation, I would say uh, about $10 a square foot or $100 per square meter. Okay? First time. And then we'll come back. I'm going to put the four and then I'll come back and ask you what you think about the, each one of them. The second type uh, is elevated. Structural slab, structural slab on piles. Okay. So in this case, you're actually elevating the foundation and the building above ground. So here is the the, the ground uh, surface, and you have basically the same. Uh, solution for the foundation and the, the house of the, 
the building is here, but that foundation is on piles. And these piles are carrying the weight of the uh, uh, building and the whole thing is elevated above ground. So the ground surface is uh, actually right here. I'm exaggerating, but you have a gap. So that e including a gap between the bottom of the beams and the ground surface, so that the soil can go up and down, uh, the structure doesn't know what's going on. Of course, what it's going to do if the soil swells, it's going to swell a lot here and a lot less here. It's going to actually pull the piles in tension, and you could crack the piles in this case, but they have to be reinforced uh, enough to be able to resist the kind of tension that the soil might uh, generate uh, on that. What's really important is that if you consider here what we might call the active zone, because the swelling and shrinking is due to the rain in the, in the uh, winter and the sun in the summer, that active zone doesn't go forever. You could have some very uh, active soil, very uh, soil that shrink and swell a lot, but if you don't have fluctuation of the water level, then like New Orleans, for example, you have some very high uh, plasticity and high shrink swell potential type of soil, but the water is always at the ground surface, uh, so there's no, no, uh, no problems with the shrinking and swelling, uh, and not as much as we have around here in, uh, in Texas. So what's important is that if this is the active zone, the piles need to be a lot deeper than the active zone. Otherwise, the piles and the active zone are moving together and you're not doing any good with this uh, solution. Cost of this solution, probably around $200 per square meter. So about two times more expensive than the other one. <clears throat> and of course, you also have uh, the backfill like this. Um, uh, both of those, well, we'll come, we'll come back on this. The third type, third type is uh, stiffened slab on grade. Stiffened slab on grade. And on piles. Okay. So in this case, you have a combination of these first two solutions. You have we're on the ground surface. We put the slab uh, stiffen like this. And it's on grade, so it's resting on the ground. But in addition to this, we have the piles underneath. Like this. Okay. Uh, this the price is intermediate between this one and this one because the slab on grade is less expensive than the structural slab, you can see that the load in this case can be taken by transferring the load to the ground. Here, the load has to be taken in free span, so this slab has to be structurally reinforced. Uh, here you sometimes you put chicken wire, I mean, you, you, know, you don't necessarily reinforce it very, very much, uh, whereas this has to be, imagine that you have the chimney here, which is the, typically the uh, heaviest part of the house, with all the bricks that are piled up. Uh, if you have a chimney here, then you're going to break the slab unless this is typically or reinforced uh, uh, properly uh, as a, a structural uh, slab. Okay, so this one 
And then the last one, uh, the last one is uh, uh, post tension. Post tension slap on gray. So in this case, you have a slab that's resting on the ground. Typically a flat slab. And you put some cables through the slab. And you have an anchor here. And then you pull here and you lock it up. So on this side here, you're going to take a, a, a jack. You're going to grab this, the cable. You're going to push on the slab, and then when you have the load that you want, you're going to lock it up, and the, the cable will be in uh, tension, and therefore the concrete here will be in compression. Uh, so the, the, the price varies quite a bit here, depending on the thickness of the, uh, of the slab itself. All right, so that's... Uh, these are the four types of, of solutions that we have for these uh, uh, foundations on trims also. So let's discuss a little bit about those. This one, I like it. I like it because it's not very expensive uh, and uh, you can really control the stiffness by deepening the beams or putting them closer together. Uh, and you can actually uh, do the design on the basis of what type of EI, you know, modulus time moment of inertia, bending stiffness of that particular stuff. So good, this one, I like it. And we're gonna put uh, a grade of good here. This one is also good, but it's more expensive. So if I have the choice, I remember in 1989 when I, when I, uh, when Janet and I built our house. Uh, well, the, the PI under my house was, uh, and I think I showed it as a case history, was very high, 60 or so. Uh, so I had to be very careful. But at the time I couldn't afford this, so I went with that, and it's turned out to be quite good. So, uh, so but this one is good as well. I would say, all right, good solution. Um, now this one is not good, I can assure you that. Why? Because uh, the piles are holding the foundation. If the soil wants to swell right here, if the soil is pushing up, then you're going to break the slab. Because the slab is not reinforced to be able to take this kind of beating. Or if the soil moves downward, then you're going to break the slab the other way, and you're going to crank it this way. Here, the soil is pushing, but the slab cannot go up because the, the piles are keeping it down. They're pulling it. The soil says, I want to move. The concrete says, well, no, you're not moving because I'm attached to the piles. And so, that's, uh, so this is bad. In fact, very bad. So we'll put a big X on that one. Make sure you don't do that or you're going to get yourself in trouble. Uh, and unfortunately, I visit some people that have those types of foundation and, and uh, uh, not much you can do once you have that. Post-tension slab on grade. This works very well provided you have a stiff enough slab. Remember, that's the whole idea. You want something that's stiff enough so that if the house wants to do this, or, I mean the soil, if the, the soil wants to do that, then you don't have enough distortion to crack the structure. So this is a good solution if EI, so we'll put it this way, good, good, if, EI is high 
in of. So you have to check that. Now there's one place where this is really good, and that's for plane surfaces. Plane surfaces. You know, I play a lot of tennis, and for tennis courts, this is a very good solution. Why? Because it prevents cracking of the uh, so the the the, uh, the structure can actually distort, deform, but it doesn't crack. And and the, the distortion, deformation on righty rate smooth, so it's not like you're going to get bad bounce uh, due to that. And and so this is a playing surfaces good right here. Now, what, um, so these are some of the solutions that we have for uh, light build, foundation of light building on uh, shrink swell. So uh, no matter what you do, there are some things that are really important. Uh, you know, you need to have, uh, regardless of your choice, you need to have drainage away from structure. Okay, that's very important. Okay. Whatever you do, if you buy a house, you look at the natural slope of the ground, if there is some, uh, and then you make sure you elevate the house with a fill so that the drainage will be automatically away from the house. If you don't change the water content, you saw the curve, in the previous lecture, if you don't change the water content, you're not going to have any uh, shrinking and swelling. So the whole idea is to try to minimize the amount of change in water content during the seasons, and certainly due to uh, rain uh, and, and rainstorm. So positive drainage away from the structure. And then the other thing that's important is watch out for trees. Watch out for trees. Why? Because they soak up a lot of water. It's amazing how much water the trees uh, need. Uh, and, and so you don't want to put big trees next to your house unless, uh, unless you're, uh, you prefer the trees to the house. You, you got to make a decision. So watch out for trees and then make sure that uh, the drainage is... Uh, so these are two major things that, that are part of uh, owner maintenance, if you wish, if you have a house on the... Uh, and remember that the house will probably be the largest single investment that you make in your life, financially. Bigger than the car, well, maybe your kid's education, that's another thing. <laughs> but, uh, but the house... Uh, uh, certainly will be a, a big one. So there's no no uh, value in trying to minimize the foundation. The foundation is going to be I don't know five percent of the uh, you know the total structure. And uh, so if you want to make it four percent, it's not worth it because you cannot fix it. Very difficult to fix the foundation. Uh, so don't put the roof if you don't have enough money. Or I'm, I'm kidding, but uh, you know you can wait on some other thing. Don't put any furniture, uh, uh, but don't uh, skimp on the foundation. It's going to be very difficult to fix if it doesn't work. All right. So that concludes this topic. I wanted to finish <coughs> by uh, let me erase this, and then we'll finish by uh, uh, talking. Well, I'll leave this on. That's all right. Um, so, this is uh, CVN 365, uh, Introduction to Geotechnical Engineering, and, and we started to talk at the beginning about soils, what they're made of, how big the particles are, and def defining a number of parameters associated with the weight and the volume of the various components. Uh, then we started to talk about how we classify the soils and the classification test and the grain size analysis and the Atterberg limits and how we use the results of these two tests to be able to classify the soil. We talked about the clays and the silts and the sands and the gravels 
And once we had a way to define which soil we're dealing with, we moved to uh, talking about uh, hydraulic conductivity and seepage and flow of water through soil. And in that topic, uh, we discussed uh, flow net, uh, we discussed how to calculate the, uh, the stresses uh, in the material, uh, we uh, discussed how to uh, calculate the, uh, the water stress uh, due to a certain water level and the pressure heads and, and so on. And, and flow and, and, uh, and hydraulic gradient, very important. Then we move to uh, talking about shear strength, uh, talking about the three types of strength, compression, tension, and shear. Compression, soil very strong, tension very weak, but we don't face it very often. So shear strength is kind of dominating the, the topic of strength in soils. In shear strength, we saw the, the main equation, S equals C prime plus sigma prime tangent phi, sigma prime being the normal effective stress on the plane of failure. Uh, and then we talked about how to measure that shear strength with the direct shear test, the triaxial test, uh, and how to be able to come and to, to uh, obtain the C prime and the phi prime from these tests by using the Mohr circle. Uh, and then uh, we talk about the special case of the undrained shear strength, uh, which is the shear strength of fine grained soils that are saturated when we don't allow drainage during the shearing process. And then the final part was deformation, uh, soil deformation, where we talked about uh, the importance of the modulus and the complexity of that particular parameter because soils being nonlinear, nonlinear. Uh, materials, there are many different types of moduli and it's very important when you talk about a modulus to, uh, to think about what strain level am I talking about, uh, what confinement level uh, am I uh, facing, uh, what is the rate of loading that's going to be associated with uh, the deformation I have to calculate and then do I have a number of cycles like in pavement versus a monotonic loading of a structure like a building. Uh, we then talked about consolidation and the consolidation theory that is also part of the deformation process. Uh, and then we finished by talking about shrink swell soils and some of the simple uh, equations that allow us to uh, predict the movement of these uh, uh, soils that uh, shrink and swell uh, significantly. Um, in the end, uh, there are a few things that you really need to remember. Uh, I think that effective stress concept is critically important. You need to, to understand that very well because it's paramount when it comes to uh, uh, soil behavior. Uh, the shear strength equation certainly and modulus is, is very important, and, and of course the hydraulic issues when you deal with uh, earth then. So that concludes this uh, topic. I've enjoyed visiting with you. I'm sorry you're not here, uh, and that this virus has been a, a royal pain in the neck, but <laughs> we have to, uh, to face it and uh, we will survive. Thank you.